to not waste any more time, I am so just tickled to be able to introduce Renska Lind, who is one of the founders of FS6, Food System 6. Uh, if some of you uh, had a chance to look at what that means, it's really about the evolution of food systems that our culture has gone through. And we're at, a, we're at the dawn of a new era, and we are creating the sixth food system model the way we want it to be in the way it should be, that prioritizes health and community health and environmental health and sustainability. And so I can't think of a better person who's been thinking about that at such a contextual level to help us uh, elicit the, the bright ideas and the innovations and the expertise of some great speakers that we are gonna come up here in the next few minutes. So without further ado, Renska, thank you. And I'm gonna invite Victor and Kate up as well and you'll get a little introduction about them in a minute. Little shorter than you, Allie, so. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. I am thrilled to be here. It's my first time in Sun Valley, and I hope it's not the last, although I think I'm reacting to altitude, so working my way through that. Um, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to help guide and shape um, and provide a little bit of context for what's happening in the global food system for the incredible speakers that you'll hear from today who are tackling some big challenges out there in the food system. Um, and as, as Ali mentioned, our work at Food System 6, we are a nonprofit based in the Bay Area. And we support innovative, impact-focused food system entrepreneurs through a 16-week program and for two to three years beyond that as they grow and build their businesses on the many different dimensions that that requires uh, with an eye towards creating, as, as she described, what we call Food System 6. So um, I will not go through the entire history of human food systems. That exceeds the bounds of what we're capable of doing today. However, I do think it is important that uh, I underscore here, um, and also in the next slide as well, that humanity really has been in the position of creating, designing the food systems that, that, that sustain us. And um, we've done that with a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity, and yes, a lot of technology, um, that really has been in reaction and response to changing circumstances, changing population, changing resources, settling down. Um, so those are just the pieces that, again, absent a deeper dive into how it is that we've constructed these different food systems I'd like for you to think about today. Um, this slide also gives you a sense that where we are in this moment in time, and that is food system five, and I should be clear, that is the dominant food system in the United States and in more quote unquote developed countries, um, but is increasingly seen in other um, emerging uh, economies and countries as well, um, is relatively recent. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more as we go about how it is that this system was designed and why. And in particular, um, our desire, and I think this is very much aligned with what I've heard in earlier conversations, what I know of the work of the people who you'll hear from today, to shift to a food system that is not simply designed for shelf life, convenience, logistics, and maximizing calories, although all incredibly noble goals that we've been very effective at achieving, but something that is more systemic in nature and that holds the attributes of physical health, environmental health, social health, the health of our communities, resilience, all the topics we've heard about today, front and center. And that, again, we there are a number of different indicators out there, and you'll hear about some of those from our panelists and in discussions that tell us that we really are at this, at this tipping point. Um, and we're really excited at FS6 and in this conversation today to surface some of these really incredible innovative ideas. I really resonated with um, the previous panelists talking about the innovators and how it is that we can build and scale and really integrate the aspects of, of what we want to see reflected in business in these early stage companies. Um, so again, just quickly, this is where we are uh, transitioning between Food System 5. 
Um, it has, again, been incredibly successful at achieving a number of its goals. But we know for a list of reasons, um, some of which are included in the program, many of which run through all of your minds uh, as you think about the food system, um, but certainly include degraded natural resources, a lack, and in fact, a loss of biodiversity, um, the unintended consequences on human health. I have, um, I'm not a big statistics person, but I do have one here. Um, recent estimates are 20 to 40 percent of the U.S. spend that the U.S. spends on health care uh, can be directly attributed to the metabolic diseases caused by food. Um, so, depending on what source you use, either Kaiser or the UC San Francisco data, um, it's approximately 680 billion dollars to 1.36 trillion dollars. So. That's one statistic of many. As Ali said, this is a complex system, so challenges sit all throughout what we call the, the value chain. But things are changing. And as uh, somebody who has been working to advance sustainable agriculture and equitable food systems for over 20 years, I couldn't be more thrilled. And again, things are changing. So we're starting to see global stakeholder groups like the World Economic Forum issue an incredible report on the role that technology can play in transforming and addressing some of the most critical issues in our global food system. They've dubbed it the Transformative 12. Phenomenal report, highly encourage you to read it. Um, we see a global alliance for the future of food has come on the stage. This is a network of philanthropists and foundations that recognize, to Ali's point, the complexities, the interrelations of how all of these different parts of this system are moving and need to move in a more aligned, coordinated effort. And of course, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, eight of the UN Sustainable Development Goals are squarely in the food system. I, of course, being a dyed-in-the-wool food system advocate, believe that you can look at any of them and make a case that food production, consumption, or distribution is connected. But eight are really um, in core in that area. Um, food waste and uh, mitigating food waste or reducing it or recycling it and plant-based alternatives are two of the top four solutions promoted in Drawdown. Food and agriculture, number 17 out of the 100 solutions in Drawdown. So um, I, I think we're, it's clear there's an evidence base and it's time for change. So um, this is a bit about what we do. You can look us up on the internet. We run a 16-week business accelerator program, like I mentioned. We're based in the Bay Area, but we support entrepreneurs from all over the world. Um, and then again, we take a portfolio management approach and work with them for two to three years, supporting all their needs. These are the key areas that we're interested in after about an 18-month deep dive talking to over 500 food system entrepreneurs and really assessing the landscape of impact and where innovation was happening um, that we felt really represented and captured some of the key areas that we were interested in building partnerships within and surfacing entrepreneurs and really innovative ideas towards solving. Um, we'll be adding to that list, I'm sure, but this at the moment represents kind of the key areas. Um, these are just some snapshots of our portfolio. We've run three cohorts. We have 23 companies um, to date, uh, 17 for-profit, six non-profit. Um, there's um, hours worth that I can tell you about how amazing each of them are, so I'll just focus on a few. Um, this is a coffee company called Port of Mocha. Um, the founder, Mukhtar, uh, was recently featured in a book by Dave Eggers called The Monk of Mocha. And this is an incredible company rebuilding the supply chain for coffee in war-torn Yemen and expanding into other war-torn regions um, and delivering an unbelievable high-quality premium coffee to the market um, based intrinsically on its social and environmental impact. So again, really resonate with that earlier conversation around um, not sacrificing or compromising. It's all, it's all baked into the work that they're doing. Pasture Map uh, is a grazing management technology platform um, that helps support and facilitate ranchers who are either already practicing regenerative practices on their ranches or are interested in transitioning towards that. Um, again, more, more than we can get into today, but there, this is uh, a quote from a recent Forbes article um, that talks about the role of pastured ruminants and effective and sustainably managed um, cattle in actually being a, a carbon, um, being 
a carbon sequestration strategy. Uh, Christine's an amazing entrepreneur. She's building uh, the first carbon data set uh, on ranches in Southern California, building partnerships with the Nature Conservancy in Colorado, um, large-scale conservation agencies in South Africa. Um, it's, you know, for those of you that are familiar with this kind of language, uh, agriculture is incredibly in need of digitized support and analytics and tools that can really help support this transition. Um, this is another set of our portfolio companies. Um, I'll focus, um, in this instance, on Milk Run. Um, and I think this is an example that we may talk about in the regional workshop around uh, a, a farmer and rancher herself, Julia, based in the Portland Marketplace, who has built uh, a last mile delivery service, so uh, akin to all of the ones that you've heard of. Um, but hers is incredibly different and it actually focuses on and includes in the business model, the farmers and ranchers that she is supporting. Um, so, and she's an amazing entrepreneur. This was our third cohort, um, and in this case, I'll focus on a pretty uh, technical solution for the grain industry. Uh, Emma Weston is a CEO from Australia, serial entrepreneur and grain farmer herself, who has developed a blockchain-enabled technology by which grain farmers have better access to what is an incredibly opaque financial accounting system. Um, so these are just some of the statistics of some of the grains that she's been moving through. Um, in Australia, she is currently coming to market in North America, and we're incredibly excited to have her in our portfolio and as representative of the future of the food system. Um, so that's my introduction. We are going to cover a wide spectrum of uh, innovative ideas, solutions, financing mechanisms um, that are out there. I think, you know, I know there's been a, a lot of conversation around how terrible we a situation we are in globally, and I couldn't agree more. I also couldn't be more excited that this is a conversation that is oriented towards solutions. Um, they're out there. We know they're out there. Um, and so, you know, the fact that there's a, a coordinated effort and a conference and this much time dedicated to scaling those solutions and really identifying how we can do that is, uh, is incredible. So, uh, I will now allow my, uh, my friends here, Victor and Kate, to both introduce themselves and share their perspective on the global context in the food system coming uh, at it from two very different um, but very connected angles. So. Go. Thank you. It's great to be here at the Sun Valley Forum. Very excited to be able to contribute to the amazing uh, dialogue that's been happening here in the last two days. Uh, Rinsky and I um, are a great combination. Um, I'm actually going to go through the history of agriculture from the dawn of time. <laughs> Uh, and I do have um, a, a lot of statistics, so I'm going to nerd out a bit um, on that, so I hope you'll um, forgive me for that. Um, when Amy and I were talking uh, before the uh, conference, she asked me to zoom out, um, so I'm going to take you up uh, on that offer, and I'm going to zoom out, sort of zoom way out. If we zoom out to planetary boundaries, we are already in a precarious position. Planetary boundaries have already been exceeded for land use, chemical use, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, energy emission, and waste creation. And while water usage is still within planetary boundary, that's of little comfort to water stress populations in sub-Saharan Africa or in the Middle East or in California, for that matter. Indeed, we have entered a new epoch, which for the first time, that epoch is being defined not by geological and species change, but instead by the scientific community's assessment that humans are having a direct effect on the fundamental nature of the planet, a new epoch. And while there are many reasons why what we do as humans have an effect on that and have these macro consequences, there's only one reason that seems to be at the intersection of them all, food how we grow, manufacture, transport, package, consume, and even dispose of food are all major drivers crashing through planetary boundaries and landing us in this new epoch. 
So one thing is absolutely clear, change must happen. And obviously the last two days have been devo devo devoted to speaking about that. Now as we zoom in from planetary boundaries into our human experience, we can see almost a perfect storm emerging. Population growth, the rising middle class, urbanization are all creating more demand for food, especially meat. The supply chains that we've built to meet those demands are accelerating deforestation, reducing biodiversity at alarming rates. Deforestation and reduced biodiversity, along with GHG from our agricultural systems, are contributing considerably to climate change. Climate change is making crop yields volatile, pressuring farming econom economies, and destabilizing populations from the lack of food and nutrition. The lack of food and nutrition in the developing world or even in uh, poorer communities of the developed world is causing developmental problems in children, including rising levels and stunting, uh, cognitive de delays and immunity disorders. And systemically, the food that we are producing through all of this activity is putting us at more risk for increased rates of cancer, diabetes, um, superbugs, and chronic illness. A perfect storm indeed. And like with climate change, the storms are getting more intense and frequent. So how do we change this? How do we produce healthy food that can meet the demands of a growing global population and still stay safely within planetary boundaries? And on a human level, how do we transform the food system into one that's more healthy, sustainable, and equitable? I've always believed that science, technology, investment, entrepreneurs, and social change agents were the key to this. It was a core to my work in co-founding SGG Ventures, one of the leading venture funds for food and agriculture. My thesis was to apply what I call systems investing to food. So what is systems investing? Systems investing for me, quite simply, is a methodology of analyzing and investing in a food system holistically. Why are the changes happening? Where are the inflection points? How do we use capital and innovation to accelerate these changes and to create and capture value? S2G now has a portfolio of 30 plus companies, many of which are fast mover, you know, first to market, transformative companies, Beyond Meat, Ripple, Sweetgreen, Mycotechnology, Terra Mera, Once Upon a Farm, just to name a few. Now, given this thesis and this team, I believe S2G is well positioned for meaningful impact and returns. But no one fund, bank, university, corporation, nonprofit, NGO, foundation alone can make the change that we need. This is going to have to be a collaborative global effort. And it was this idea that gave birth to Food Shot Global. It'll be my honor to launch Food Shot Global in September with a world-class group of founding partners, Rabobank, Generation Investment Management, Mars, the Innovation Institute for Food and Health at UC Davis, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation through a new vehicle called the Builders <laughs> Initiative, Armonia, the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture. What we have created is a unique hybrid model aligning equity, debt, and non-dilutive prize dollars to empower groundbreaking visionary entrepreneurs um, and change agents. We are not seeking incremental change. We are seeking moonshots for better food, food shots. We'll be inviting businesses to submit their companies and their groundbreaking work for funding. Together with our partners, we will select finalists to receive equity and debt funding, as, long as, po as well as post-investment uh, support that'll ensure impact, scale, and success. Additionally, we are going to award annually the Groundbreaker Prize to research, social entrepreneurs, and public policy and educational uh, advocates. At present, with the present um, commitments, the Groundbreaker Prize will be the largest food and agriculture prize in the country. So what problems are we looking to solve? Foodshot will be taking some of these on. The challenges are many. Where do we begin? Ensuring protein security, feeding the microbiome, 100% food transparency, zero food waste, food secure cities, just to name a few. 
At our launch in September, we will publicly reveal the first Food Shot Global Challenge. But here today, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a preview. I think it'll be helpful in thinking about global si food systems change. We are calling the inaugural challenge Innovating Soil 3.0. So why are we calling it Soil 3.0? Soil began its journey as a rich, complex, <coughs> evolutionary ecosystem that has enabled architecture, uh, agriculture to take root. This was Soil 1.0. And for millennia, that worked. Soil did its thing, farming was hard, but we got pretty good at it, and the human population thrived. And so we needed more food and to better control its production. So in the 20th century, we invented synthetic fertilizers and industrialized farming. This solved a lot of the food security issues that had emerged from World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II when food was scarce and calories were valuable. With wars and depression behind us, stability and prosperity led to massive population growth, the baby boom here in Europe, and across the world, developing nations rose out of poverty. And again, more food was needed. Technology advanced to meet that demand, mechanization evolved, herbicides and pesticides intensified, and GMOs engaged to work with these chemicals. Yields improved, and calories became cheap, very, very cheap. For 100 years now, the effect of all of this on soil has been that soil has become primarily a delivery medium for chemicals to fight weeds, pests, diseases, but ultimately to enhance yields. This is soil 2.0. And yes, while yields have increased and many pests and weeds were killed along the way, this system is destroying organic matter, turning soil into dirt and we are losing soil to dirt at alarming rates. For every pound of grain that we produce, we lose a pound of soil. And at those rates, actual healthy soil will be lost in 50 years, some supporting data. 25% of the world's agricultural soils have been damaged to the point where they can no longer be effectively used for agriculture. 10 million hectares of cropland are lost annually because of soil erosion. For every 0.1 meter of soil erosion, yields are reduced 4%. There's a 10% loss of yield for every one degree of higher temperature. And we burn 10 calories of fossil fuel for every one edible calorie. Any other species on the planet would not survive expending that much energy to secure food. What we have created is this vicious circle of both intended and unintended consequences. Chemical fertilizers, as it turned out, only work well, and by well, I mean its most monolithic meaning, to enhance yields. It only works well in depleting or depleted soils. And so more and more chemicals get applied to soils to prop up yields further depleting the soil. Tilling releases carb carbon otherwise um, retained in the soil into the atmosphere, therefore intensifying the effects of climate change and further pushing soil into distress. But to add insult to systemic injury, yield growth for uh, soil 2.0 has been stalling. According to the FAO, the rates of yield growth for most uh, crop crops have been decelerating in recent decades. For cereals, which occupy more than half the world's harvested area, the slowdown in growth has been pronounced, dropping from 3% growth per annum in the 1960s to less than half that growth in the 1990s before ticking up slightly in the last decade. This is just really flawed systems design. High growth chemical inputs coupled with decelerating growth in output in yield. And you don't have to look under the soil to see the effects of this flaw design. It manifests at a macro scale in algae bloom and dead zones in the Gulf and desertification in sub-Saharan Africa. The effects are dramatically visible. The loss of organic matter in soil could be the most underappreciated environmental crisis humanity now faces. But it's not just an environmental crisis, it's becoming a food security and human health crisis. 
Currently, 40% of soil in Africa is degraded. This is particularly worrisome because according to the FAO, some 80% of sub-Saharan African people depend on land for their livelihood. And production is, in Africa is going to need to uh, increase 100% by 2050 to keep up with population demand. All of this makes soil erosion a pressing social, economic, and environmental issue for all of us. Clearly, soil 2.0 cannot meet the demands of a growing global population and a resource-constrained planet. The time is here for ground-up transformational change. We have to grow more with less. What we need is a new soil operating system, soil 3.0. We know more now about the movement of the celestial bodies than we do about the soil underfoot. Now, I'd like to take credit for that quote, but that quote was Leonardo da Vinci in the year 1500, <laughs> and it is clear today as it was then. So if we're going to create a new soil operating system, we have to actually understand what soil is. Well, Webster defines soil as the upper layer of earth where plants grow, a black or dark brown material, typically consisting of a mixture of organic, ma ma organic matter, clay, and rock particles. Well, that may be what soil is, but it's not its essence. I'd rather think about soil this way. Soil is the realm in which microbial life recycles the remains of higher life into the raw materials of new life. So let's think about that for a second. Soil is the realm of microbial life that recycles the remains of higher life into the raw materials for new life. This soil took billions of years to evolve, to create this equilibrium. But soil is not a tranquil place. It's a below ground ballet and battle between bacteria and mycorrhiza who tur turn organic matter into soluble nutrition. It's a place where predatory armies of arthropods and nematodes and protozoa advance and consume that bacteria and excrete micronutrients, which in turn feeds the rhizospheric bac uh, bacteria who manage the chemical exchange of nutrients through the roots to the plant which in turn triggers secretion of photosynthesized carbohydrates from the plant through the roots into the soil to feed the soil bacteria in order to start that cycle all over again. It's an amazing symbiont symphony of soil. And we're killing it. It reminds me of that scene in La La Land. I know that's a rough transition, <laughs> but stick with me on this one. I promise there will be no singing. Sebastian and Mia are at the Lighthouse Jazz Club listening to jazz music. He's trying to communicate to Mia that the ballet and battle of the music happening on stage in real time, the rich sophistication of the players, each with a role contributing to this magnificent musical medium. And he laments for jazz that it's dying, dying on the vine, Mia. And people say, it's had its day. Well, not on my watch. Well, that's where I think we are. We can't let soil, this deeply dynamic ensemble of microbes, protozoa, fungi, nematodes, arthropods, minerals, and organic soil, die, not on our watch. In order for us to meet this coming challenge and create a food system that is truly healthy, sustainable, and equitable, we have to work with nature. We have to use technology and innovation in concert with regenerative processes, not only to counteract the damage of 100 years of damage of soil 2.1, 2.0, but to accelerate the evolution of soil 3.0 and to secure its place in the 21st century and beyond. Fuchai Global is prepared to do its part. We will identify and invest in groundbreaking solutions in which advances in biology, chemistry, genetics, sensing, data, machine learning, robotics will form a new soil operating system and through it, we will empower soil to sustain 10 billion people and sustain the planet. Thank you. Wow, what a...
powerful framing of the whole context. I don't even have to do my job. I feel like that just laid everything out. Um, thank you, Amy, so much for having me. It's an honor to be here in this group. What an extraordinary two days. Um, I'm Kate Geegan, and I am a registered dietitian by trade. That's my background. And I wrote a book with Rodale in 2009 called Go Green, Get Lean, really looking at this intersection between what health professionals are talking about on the side of human health and human resilience, and really this understanding that it ladders back to the food system. Today's Nutrition Facts panel actually doesn't tell consumers really anything of what they want to know anymore. It's very outdated. And as has been mentioned today and yesterday, um, with Drawdown, eight of the top 20 solutions lie in food. So bringing this to the consumer is really where I have focused. How do we take that nutrition and health lens and take these opportunities for more sustainable, resilient food systems and really accelerate this at the consumer level? And so Amy had asked me to share, since Victor did such a great global setup, and then we're gonna jump to more local, to kind of take it in the middle and really with the health lens, um, what are these opportunities we're seeing in the marketplace? For the past 10 years, that's been my work with companies like Cliff Bar and Camelback and Earth's Best Organic Baby Food and commodity boards like the Almond Board of California, Compass Food Service doing 8 billion meals, um, having this impact because what we know is health doesn't happen in the healthcare system, it happens at the grocery store. The average person is seeing their primary care provider maybe one time a year. They're in and out of a grocery store 15 times a month. So I thought I would just very quickly, because I have about seven minutes left, share six opportunities that I'm seeing that really can still have a lot of space to grow in the marketplace that meet the consumer where they are at. Because the beauty of this movement is the metrics 21st century eaters want is what the 21st century food system needs, right? We have families now, they see themselves as stakeholders in the food system and CEOs of their home. So how can we leverage those dollars and spin a story with an immediate positive impact that ladders back to them and their family right away? So here are six opportunities to really build on that beautiful Ode to Soil 3.0. I couldn't agree more. The science on the human health and human resilience side is converging in this space. And what we see is that a farm with on-farm microbial diversity, soil health, biodiversity on the farm, literally translates into resilience in those communities who live nearby. Research on Swedish farms, looking at kids living on um, traditional Swedish farming operations versus those who don't. Kids living traditional farms exposed to this microbial diversity have one-tenth the rate of allergies as kids who don't. Now, I know as a parent, I have an 11 and 13-year-old, and food allergies right now are one of the biggest concerns we have. This diversity of microbial growth that regenerative agriculture has confers a beneficial prote protection. In the US, New England Journal of Medicine came out with a report looking at Amish farms. Kids growing up in Amish traditional farming operations have dramatically lower rates of asthma and allergies. And it's almost like if you flip it, if you look at um, industrial agriculture here, we see higher rates of these exact challenges. So I think this is a lot of white space and opportunity still to flesh out these connections so that the the issue is about building human resilience now in addition to a food system that works for us. I'm totally obsessed with cover crops. When we talk about the food supply and the hundreds of millions of acres that we're growing these commodities, which, hey, economies of scale, we need to grow these big commodities. I, there's a big gap here. Um, I was served a cover crop risotto at Dan Barber's Blue Hill Farm a couple years ago. It had a nitrogen-fixing legume, some barley, some clover. My palate went crazy and I loved it, but the dietitian in me was like, oh my God, this is so great. I'm boosting protein, I'm boosting omega-3s. Look at this slow-release carbohydrate, the way my body was designed. Cover crops 
can capture some of that economic opportunity in the supply chain while also delivering health benefits on the plate. Imagine a school lunch program with a cover crop breakfast cereal or a cover crop cracker um, you know, at, in university or food service settings. A third opportunity that I think we really um, have the potential to maximize is this organic profitability and pr prosperity. Right now, 5% of our supermarket is organic. That's 5% of the marketplace. It's 1% of our farmland. We are exporting that economic opportunity overseas. Those could be used to enrich and improve resilience in the United States. It's another lever for this economic resilience. This is research out of um, the Organic Trade Association in 2016, looking at not just benefits. From the science side, we know people living near um, more conventional animal production have higher exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria because 70% of our antibiotics are used in livestock conventional. But real economic benefits, we see a poverty reduction of up to 1.35% in organic hotspots. Now for comparison, the US um, Census Bureau lists SNAP benefits as giving a 1.5% reduction. So, Here's an engine that can deliver those same benefits, but in a much more profound way for creating resilience in these communities and for consumers who want this. Sustainable protein is huge. I don't have time to go into it um, right now, but I'm happy to have conversations later with anybody. When we look at plant forward, right, the consumer talks about plant forward. We know there's been 20% growth in the marketplace around plant forward. That's a combination, because there's only three nutrients that deliver calories, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. Well, alcohol too, but we can't really include that, right? Um, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. So protein right now, depending what food tribe you're in, is between 12 and 35% of your calories. So to get to plant forward, we have to really scale sustainable protein. There's a lot of um, interest in this space and also where it ladders up to human health benefits. So Protein Challenge 2040 is a great resource if you wanna sort of dive deeper into these options. Um, and before I even get to these five innovation areas, Something that we haven't talked at this conference at all really about um, that I think is a huge opportunity is ocean farming. These fishermen who are, um, have lost this opportunity as fish stocks have been depleted, they are really looking for what is this economic resilience with ocean farming. And if you're not familiar with Green Wave, has anyone heard of Green Wave? Raise your hand. The, that company, last year, Rolling Stone listed their CEO and founder as one of the top 25 individuals changing the world. And Time Magazine, one of the innovative ideas shaping the future. It's open source 3D vertical farming for kelp and seafood mussels, okay? Where you're using nature's input, so it is zero input, zero antibiotics, and producing nutrient-rich food for humans Kelp is rich in protein and minerals. Um, and then those sea mussels, all those healthy protein sources that also filter our oceans. So I think in terms of an investment and capital opportunity that ladders directly to human health and resilient economies, ocean uh, regeneration with these farming communities to create living wages, a living planet, and healthy food outputs is, is great. Um, livestock, we can't go into too much, but with livestock and protein production expected to double in the next 20 years, we need cleaner meat, regenerative meat, and um, solutions. We, we see in the science that animals grazed on these regenerative um, systems have healthier nutrient profiles, more akin to wild game of our ancestors. Um, legumes are another huge opportunity. We need scale of legumes in agriculture. Uh, 2016 was the United Nations Year of the Pulse for its trifecta of being incredibly helping to build resilient food systems, affordable and economical as a protein that can be deployed globally, as well as delivering real health benefits, reducing chronic disease, inflammation, um, 
because of that nutrient package. Then there's these next generation things, just protein, um, using a mung bean source for an egg scramble. We all know about the Impossible Burger. Um, crickets are another big source. Our military is looking at that quite a bit because it's incredibly efficient to create grams of protein at scale. Um, and then these next gen Memphis meats with, with cultured meat. So we're really in the middle of this story. Some of these we don't know exactly where the health outcome is. You know, we're, we're waiting for cellular ag and cultured meat, what the health benefits will be in some of this, but we need all these tools on the table to transform protein. Last two quickly, um, food waste. I know that's in the sustainable development goals. It's in drawdown. 40% of the food we produce is tossed before it's eaten or lost in the supply chain. That's like going to the grocery store and coming out with three bags, dropping one in the, in the parking lot, and then just keep going. Even worse than that. And we know that in the US, 21% of landfill is food waste. So there's an incredible opportunity. These are very early starts in the marketplace, but I think looking at innovation and how we can supply solutions, obviously are through the supply chain, that work needs to be done, but at the consumer level, things that deliver on a nutrition story. Misfit Juice is doing pressed juices from um, farm, farm produce that would otherwise be lost. And then Fabinets, raise your hand if you've heard of aquafaba as a, a tool right now, especially for vegans. I know I've met a lot of vegans here. This is like the secret weapon chefs are using. It's huge on vegan blogging, and this is one of the first commercial applications I've seen. It's chick, uh, cooked chickpea water. What is left over when you cook the chickpeas actually has some proteins and other nutrients that let you build this beautiful foam that mimics egg whites. So talk about switching from a plant protein, you know, swapping that out on animal um, and being used, food service is looking at this, Compass is looking at this, how they can scale this through their uh, channels. And the beauty of a lot of this with food waste is we can bring high calorie nutrients to people who need it most. And perfect produce, CSA of misshapen or um, otherwise sort of re rejected produce, this is 30 to 50% cheaper than buying fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. So these are immediate solutions that can improve access and accessibility um, for people who need it most with all of these savings. I also think a huge opportunity in the science is packaging. I know people have talked about that, but just last week, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a policy statement specifically raising the alarm on BPA, phthalates, plastic packaging, and impact on children, because children are in these critical windows of metabolic, neural, hormonal pathways being laid down, and this disproportionate impact. So whether you, we can start with a zero waste grocery aisle, imagine that impact um, for that story. And lastly, we have to expand this mission for our most vulnerable. 47% of babies born in the US today qualify for WIC. That is a government assistance program. And for the average American child, more than half their calories are coming from school lunch every single day. We need, if we are to create resilient humans and resilient communities, these are opportunities where we can up-level. Um, I was recently involved in a project with Earth's Best where we are now the first organic baby food available to WIC families in the United States. So, thank you. <laughs>